We left off on page 124 there. Uh, Verse 18, it says, as the scientists say, okay, so says Yahweh, the best cure is prevention. You see that right there? If you got your book, it's in the right-hand column in the middle of the page there. Uh, So we were talking about the heavenly beings that were there and how they're going through the same problems, you know, and having the same problems as here on earth of people trying to find something that would cure, and of course the incurable diseases. So verse 18, it says, that the scientists say, so says Yahweh, the best cure is prevention. Prevention is what Yahweh offers, okay? And that's the reason he said to us, and to the 12 tribes, I can take away sickness away from you. I can take disease away from you. I can promise you a life of joy and peace. Okay, because prevention is what Yahweh offers. He doesn't want us to have to go through the problems and and actually have the diseases. He wants to take these things away from us. And that's why he gives us his law. Because remember, it's the laws of Yahweh is what will give us eternal life. It will keep us alive through our obedience. So he says, well, we don't realize how important peace is right now. You know, because it's true. You know, the peace... The peace of Yahweh says passes all understanding. You know, we we can't even comprehend what Yahweh's peace is really all about. He says it's less realized in this day and age because Hollywood is pushing excitement, intrigue, excitement, and romance. And they're making you think that this is what you should seek for. You know, and this is what people look for. This is what they actually think that... The, the world has the offer, you know, and that this is what life is all about, you know, is to have ex- excitement and romance and so forth, you know. This has, an, has nothing to do with life itself. They're making you think that this is what you should seek for. These things do not bring joy, okay? They don't bring any joy at all. And for your reference notes, um, Romans twelve twelve, you know, it says, don't, be, don't conform to this world, okay? Don't conform to the ways of this world. Yeah, code 4, 4. In Yaakov 5.15, you know, it talks about if you're a friend of Yahweh, then you're an enemy. You know, if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of Yahweh. Okay, that's Yaakov 4.4 and 5.15 and Romans 12.12. You know, because, you know, if you conform to the world, then you become worldly. You become a whirling. You don't become, a, you're not a, a person of Yahweh. Okay, this next paragraph. Highlight this next two sentences. It says, when the world's fairs were first brought into reality, the Catholic Church saw this and they said, Man, this just fits right in what we teach. We need to generate this energy into the world and then associate it subtly with the Catholic Church. Okay, highlight that section, the world fair. Okay. Um, and if you think they're still not involved in this stuff, look at this. Pope Francis can showcase the beauty, says fairs can showcase the beauty of culture. Pope Francis tells the global, and this is the global, this is not just in Rome, the global association of the exhibition industry, that fairs and exhibitions offer significant opportunity for showcasing to the wider world the rich diversity and the beautiful beauty of local cultures and eco- ecosystems. So the global association of the exhibition industry, or the UFI, is an international network of the world's leading trade show organizers and fair ground owners. The association is in Rome on the occasion of its global executive summit. The Pope noted that despite the many potential difficulties that can arise in the course of preparing and realizing fairs and exhibitions, these events can create a network of just human relations that can endure well beyond the event itself. Okay, so it shows you that they are definitely still involved in these things. Okay, it's not something that's, that's, that's just, you know, passed on. It's something that they are actively involved in because, you know, the Catholic Church has their hands in, in everything surrounding the world. It's this life system. It's this beastly system that they control. Okay, back to the book. It says, so they proceeded to buy all the state fairs. Now, whether they got them all or not, I don't know. He says, history shows that they were trying to buy them, trying to own them, and to manage them because they want this energy of excitement. 
They want this energy of excitement. They want to have a control over this. Okay? Because having this, this excitement and having noticed the energy, of course, the energy comes from Satan. Remember when it talks about the, the, the energy that Satan puts out. Okay? It, it's, it's a means by which they can make people, you know, they just fall into the, into the, the, the trap that they set for them, thinking that this is what life is all about when it's not. So what they're doing and what they're still doing now with television is what they failed to do totally with the world's fairs. They can only reach a few of the people that way. Well, now they're doing it with the TV sets. They're pushing queers. And that's true. That's all you see on the stinking TV, on the news and everything. These people are all over the place, you know. Uh, now, somebody said the other day that you could get in trouble talking about gays. I said, well, I don't talk about gays. I have mentioned queers a time or two, but I don't know if that's the same as gays or not. I said, I don't know what these people are. <laughs> as Elder Yadidia said, the English language is hard to learn. I'm from Oklahoma, and they didn't allow them when I was young. He says, they might do so now because they're certainly pushing them. But notice it says the next sentence. This is pushed and has been pushed by Sodom and Gomorrah down to now. Okay, down to now. This is a reference source that you can also use. Remember 23, 13 and 14. He says, I have seen folly. That is offense in the prophets of Samaria. Remember, Samaria means those who have the mark of the beast. Okay. They prophesied by Baal, the Lord. And it caused my people, Israel, to err. Okay, so they caused Israel to go astray because they worshiped the Lord. Okay, I've seen in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. Notice this, it's a horrible thing. They commit adultery. They walk in lies. They turn from Yahweh and they follow after the gods. Remember, adultery doesn't just mean the physical thing. It means going after the gods, the God worship as well. They have also strengthened the hands of evildoers. Those who worship the gods. Remember Genesis 3, 5. The evil doers. Those who do evil like the gods. So that no one turns back from their wickedness. They're not, they're not trying to pull people back. You know. And instead, they're allowing them and encouraging them to do wickedness. And notice, all of them are like Sodom to me, Yahweh says. And her inhabitants are like Gomorrah. Okay? They're like Gomorrah. Whether, you know, they are definitely pushing this big time. And like Romans says, uh, you know, for he will finish the work, Romans 9, 28 and 29. He says, for he will finish the work, yet cut it short in righteousness, because Yahweh will make a short work upon the earth. And note, Yahweh has to have a short work. Okay? Why is that? Because, remember, he said in this, through his prophet Isaiah, and as Isaiah said before, unless Yahweh of Shabbat, host of armies, had left us a seed... We would have become like Sodom, and we would have been made like Gomorrah. So unless the seed of righteousness was planted and allowed us to grow in the last days, we would be cut off, and everybody on earth would eventually become Sodomites. Every last person would be Sodomites. There would be no house of Yahweh. But remember, he carried that forth that seed, and he allowed it to take place, and we are the seed of Israel Hawkins. Um, but this lifestyle... You know, this lifestyle, of course, it just brings plagues. And if you look up the Greek word, the Greek word for plague is plague. Plague. And that's the way it's spelled. P-L-A-Y dash G-A-Y. Plague. Okay, and that's exactly what they do. They play, as in, they play the gay lifestyle, right? And they're bringing the curses upon themselves. And you can see the result of what's taking place now, you know, with, you know, with the coronavirus and so forth, you know. And one thing I want to mention, too, okay, is that the house of Yahweh has been very clear in telling you what to do. We have made announcements. Pastor has said it several times, so it should be in everybody's mind, that you should be wearing a mask. Of course, we know that the mask itself for us is not going to do anything because if you have the mark of Yahweh, that's your protection. However, we are here to honor the king, just like the law of Yahweh says to do. And the governor is the governor of Texas. 
And his mandates are to wear a mask. Now, I've heard some people say, well, you know, Judge Neffin here, who's a local judge, you know, they lifted the ban so you don't have to wear them. If you're going to go by that, then that means you're going to be paying attention to the local government here rather than by the government of Yahweh. Because Yahweh's government has already told you to wear the mask. So if you see anybody without it, especially young people and stuff, make sure that they're wearing a mask, okay? Tell them, point it out. Bring forth the, the, the righteousness of Yahweh. Be obedient. If not, well, you might consider that in confession. It's because you need to confess for being rebellious. Not wearing a mask, not doing what you always said to do. Okay, and it's, that's not honoring your overseer. Okay, and you know how, where that goes from. Okay, so he says, uh, they pushed this and have been pushed with Sodom and Gomorrah down to now. It's the same with the dress styles as being offered on today's market and pushed by Hollywood. And of course, it's the gays. Okay, these queers, whatever you want to call them, you know, they got a billion stinking names. They got like a hundred and something different names, I think, that you can call yourself because they're so stupid and confused that they don't even know what the hell they are, you know. They don't know whether they're male or female. But it's the same with this lifestyle, with the dresses, because they are the ones that design this stuff. They're the designers. And the way they design the clothes is exactly that, is to push, push forth lust in the eyes of men and in women, and one after the other. And they were pushed in Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, your Bible says that. He says, I'll show it to you in Scripture, hopefully before this sermon is out, before the week is out anyway. He says, this is what's coming forth to you from the television. Television. You know, in 2019, there was 214 million TV sets sold. So you're talking about hundreds of millions of TVs being sold every year. Year after year after year after year. Some years a little higher, some years a little lower. But 2019, was the last result I got was 214 million sets were sold. And you think, you know, well, how many TVs do you need? Well, you've got to have at least one in every house. And I mean, in every room in your house. And that's the way people look at it, you know, because they, and they'll turn them all on. And they'll walk from one room to the other so they don't ever miss their shows and so forth. But, but it's crazy. I mean, people have more than one television set in their homes, you know, it's, 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 and it's just feeding them constantly. Now, Satan's trying to turn people, and this is a strong pull. And if you remember when you watched TV, it was a strong pull. One of the ways I got out of it is that when I was watching something, I watched it almost all the way to the end, and I'd get up, out of the room, got, I'd get up and I'd go in the other room. Wouldn't see the end of the show. And people who were with me was like, where are you going? Where are you going? I don't, I'm leaving. <laughs> you know? And you start training yourself to draw away from this stuff because you see that you don't need it, you know? And eventually everybody got away from, from watching TV. Hopefully everybody does. Nobody in the house of Yahweh does that now. But, but it's a very strong pull. And it says the sexual pull is a strong pull, a lustful pull, because it's in everyone. You know, and of course, the, the, um, the retailers know that. And of course, they use, you know, sex sales can sell, sex can sell anything, you know, and they'll use it to sell anything. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be a burnt mat matchstick, and they'll sell it, you know, in that manner. But it's something that attracts people, you know, and it gets their attention and stuff. And even the way that products are shaped and formed, you know, if you've ever noticed any of that kind of stuff, you'll see where they're shaped and formed in particular shapes. And that's just to entice a person's mind. And, but people are too ignorant to even realize those things. But the sexual pull is a strong pull. It's a lustful pull. It's in everyone. Yahweh made it for a purpose, and it's needful for a man and his wife for this to take place. It's needful, and it binds the family. But there's nothing in the unholiness of the Catholic Church or the Christian or Christianity, period that would bind people together. There is nothing, there is nothing in a bunch of queers, men or women, that would bind them for very long at all. It's just a lustful desire, that's it. But there's nothing there that will bind them. You remember, for your references, Genesis 2, 24, you know, a man will leave his, his family, 
you know, and being joined together with his wife. They will become as one. That's male and female. In Ephesians 5, 25 and 26, you remember it talks about being as a unity, husband and wife. It's a great mystery, but it's pertaining to the kingdom of Yahweh, okay? Talking about the kingdom of Yahweh, man and wife and the unity that is there. Because remember, Yahweh's house is a family, okay? Now, underline this next sentence here. It says, the family life is the greatest thing there is. Also underline, I have found that there is, there is the greatest joy on earth in family living, sharing and the joy that you have with one another in the family if it is kept clean. Okay? And remember, this is not just talking about married life. It is also referring to the fact that it's talking about being in the house of Yahweh as a family. You find great joy with one another, but it has to be kept clean. You know, you can't be lusting after the women. You have to control those things. And it's going to be a short time, and eventually one day we'll have great enjoyment throughout all eternity. You can allow unholiness to enter in, notice. Very easy to allow unholiness to enter in. There is a certain amount of lust in every gathering. And if you watch it, it will come forth. You will see it. And if you think back, I know you've seen this before, but you'll see men looking their brothers' wives up and down in these gatherings that were instituted again in Hollywood. You know, when they get together, you know, they think nobody's looking or whatever, but you, you'll catch the, gli- the eyes of, of the men, you know, they'll be glancing the women up and down, up and down. Uh, reference source for that is Leviticus 18.20, 1820, Exodus 20.17, and Deuteronomy 5.21. That's Leviticus 18.20, Exodus 20, 17, Deuteronomy 5, 21. And, of course, that talks about adultery and do not covet your neighbor's wife, okay? Um, but looking, notice, looking. And let me, let me, I want to I go through this again because this, we read this last time, but this is, has to do with um, what we covered before in the last chapter. This is in chapter 15, Verse 45, when it says, now get this in your minds because I'm going to show you the rest of it in detail in the following scriptures of what sin does to you when you start thinking on it. When you start thinking on it, something goes into your mind. We now know from scientific reports and evidence that certain things are held in the body, kind of in prison. The body is holding them there and it will not let it go to the mind. We also know that under certain conditions that these things are released. One of the ways this is done is by looking at someone to lust after that you have no permission to lust after. And this releases some of those things in the body. Okay? Now, the eye. Here's the eyeball. Okay? Light enters into the eye. Okay? And you remember what Yeshua said? Uh, We'll cover this in just a moment. Well... He says the light of the body is the eye, okay? But what I want to show you here is with the eye. As light enters in, it comes in and hits the back of the, of, of the retina, okay? And you have your, your optic nerve. And this is where all that information is going to the brain, okay? It's entering into the eye. That's the, that's the entrance level. It's a hole in your head, okay? And it's letting the light in, and it's going to it. Now, Yeshua said in Luke 11... I can get my paper straight here. Okay. He said, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if the eye is clear-sighted, your whole body is also full of light. But when your eye is bad, in fact, the King James Version uses the word evil, evil like the gods, then your body is also full of darkness. Okay? So what enters into the eye is what goes into your brain. Now, the eye is one of the five senses, sense organs of the human body. And then this allows us to see objects around us, all right, to view objects. And we take in more than 80% of information through your eyes. Not so much your eyes are used. We take in information with over 120 million photosensors that's located in your eyes. And that's a lot of information being transmitted to the brain, okay? Remember, it comes in and it goes to the brain, okay? Now... 
Yeshua, you know, notice he says, the light of the body is the eye. Okay? The light of the body is the eye. Now, Yeshua said, don't judge things outwardly. Well, why did he say that? Why not judge things outwardly? Outwardly is what you see, right? With your eyes. Because we have to know the real image of things that we see to know if what we're seeing is righteous and helpful to us, or is it unrighteous and unhelpful to build our moral righteous character. Now, here's an example, okay? You know, when you look at a chair, you're not actually seeing a chair. You're seeing a bunch, a bunch of photons, photons, which are light particles, atoms, and they're being reflected off of the chair. So in the process of reflecting off the chair, these photons have been arranged in a pattern that resembles the chair. So when the photons strike your retina, the cone and the rod cells in the back of your eyes detect this, and then it sends a signal to your brain, and in this way your brain thinks it's looking at a chair. Okay, And that's any object that you see. So you can see that it's not actually seeing it, but it's seeing an out, outline, that, the form of it and stuff. And so when Yeshua said, don't judge the outward appearance, you have to know what you're looking at. And you have to be careful because everything that you see, you know, and that's how you learn the best is by seeing and hearing, right? You see something and you hear it, and that information goes and stores better in your brain when you see these things. So you have to be careful. And this is what he was saying with the eyes being the light of the body. That light needs to be the laws of Yahweh that we are thinking upon and allowing to come into our minds, but not allowing something else that is wickedness or evil, to come into our minds or into our bodies, enter into our eyes. And you see it all the time. And this was less from Hollywood. is when you go out, you know, and you see these women and men dressed the way that they are. And remember, you see a man in T-shirts or tight jeans or a butt, unbuttoned shirt, you're seeing nickings, okay? You're participating in homosexuality, Okay? And that's the thing with porn. That's why porn is, is, is it's homosexuality because you're looking at men and women. You know, but when you see any of, any of this stuff that's out there in the world, these are the things that went into your mind. And this is what Satan uses to try and make people lust and so forth. And, then, and, and when, when that takes place, remember Jacob said, it's not the temptation. It's what you do with the temptation. That's the danger. If you dwell on the temptation, you keep feeding it and feeding it and feeding it, it takes over the body. And once you start feeding your mind and allowing your mind to get fed, it's going to go with it. And it's going to eventually cause you to sin because it's going to be much stronger than anything because you're going to get to a certain point where you can't turn back because your body, you've already opened up your body and your mind now to that driving force to commit that sin, and you will do so. And that's why they said, don't look upon a woman with lust. Don't even look upon a woman. How long does it take to lust? A nanosecond? You know? You, you, it, it's immediately. You, you can't say, you can't put a time frame on how long it takes to lust. It's not when you feel some reaction. You've already, it, you know, light travels at the speed of light. You've already seen something already, and it's already entered into your mind. Before you even have time to react, it's already entered into your mind. Okay, so you have to guard these things. Okay, so he says, the Hollywood, uh, the Hollywood party started about 50 years ago, and they've been pushing since. He says, you have a party, and you get together, and you swap. In other words, he's talking about swapping wives. And it's become more wicked and more sinful down through the years. We see this, he says, and history shows it. Now, highlight this next two sentences. He says, this whole paragraph here. As you, read, as you read in my last newsletter, the government inspectors said this is the worst generation of kids yet. He showed how the people were putting them in front of toys and TV sets and things to teach them, but their minds do not have to think in this way. Their minds are decaying. They are rotting. Okay, highlight that whole section there. He shows the people that put the children in front of TV sets to teach them, and of course their minds don't have to think because... They're just being fed visually and audibly, audible through the teaching that's coming forth from that, from that TV. And so it's going into their minds. They don't have to think. They just watch. And their minds are rotting, literally rotting away. There's an article here. Of some, it says, how much TV is too much? The average American spends up to 34 hours a week watching live television. 34 hours a week. 
Just think how much studying they could get done in that amount of time. Traditionally, younger adults tend to watch less TV than older folks, but there's evidence that the under 35 crowd is becoming more and more likely to watch TV shows on computers and mobile devices. They do. They watch YouTube and they watch all these different things. In fact, research suggests people between the ages of 18 and 34 watch more than two hours of internet or mobile video per week, in addition to the average 23 hours they spend tuned into live TV. Some research suggests that all this time watching TV, it's on the traditional tube or smartphone, might be taking a negative toll on our health. One study found that every hour spent watching TV, our life expectancy decreases by 22 minutes. 22 minutes. So you figure for every hour, that's about one-third of that amount of time is going to be deducted from your life. Well, this is what they're feeding their minds, total corruption. So let's get back to the book. He says, I told you this about 1,000 years ago, I think. He says, well, at least 50 years ago. I told you that the worst-shaped people I had ever seen was when I went out selling the Blue Ribbon Bibles door-to-door, which was about 50 years ago. I saw people at that time when I was selling these things who were sitting in front of TV sets. I don't think they even had a sense enough to know how to turn the thing on or off, or that's the one thing that they did know. You could talk to them, and they wouldn't even hear you. Their minds were just in a gaze at this TV set. He says, well, that's what's occurring to today's children because their parents are trying to get them out of their minds and out of their business. The parents, they were taught about 50 years ago to start seeking this pleasure and this excitement. Seeking this pleasure and this excitement. You remember as a reference, uh, Exodus 32, 6, remember it says they, they ate, they drank, and they rose up to play, right? They rose up to play. They rose up to play gay, right? To the plagues, to the iniquity, to the abominations that they committed. This is what they did. And this is what they were teaching their children. And each generation is taught this. So when there's one generation is taught it, they're going to pass what they've been taught, they're going to pass on to the next generation. That generation will take what they've been taught and add to it and teach that to the next generation. And that generation will do the same. So it's over and over and over and over again. And this is how, you know, like the, the Jews take pride in their oral traditions and stuff, okay? Well, it's the same thing that, they've, that every, everybody on earth has done They've taken these traditions and they've taught them over and over and over again to their, to their children. Um, back in the book, he says, now, before that, this wasn't taught, okay? It wasn't taught before that. The down-to-earth family life of teaching, joy, and working with one another was what was went on in the families until television or entertainment was brought in, okay? When it was brought in. Uh, and you remember your reference source is Deuteronomy 6, verse 7, where it says to teach your children diligently, right? And Proverbs 22, 6, that if you teach them properly, then they will not depart from what you've taught them, okay? Um, he says, well, now the ones who have grown up and have children at this time have been geared, notice, they have been geared to seek entertainment, teaching their children it's not entertainment to them. They, they, they don't want to teach their children. They have no desire to teach their children. People want to have children, but they don't want to take care of children. They don't want to raise the children, you know. And, and you have to, you, you know. Scripture tells you that. In Proverbs 1, 6 and 8, it says, Now the reverence of Yahweh is the beginning. It's the beginning. It's the first requirement. It's the chief part of knowledge. By which you'll get wisdom, of course, if you apply it. The reverence of Yahweh. It's the beginning of knowledge. And only fools, notice, only those who are morally perverse, morally perverse, and that's what you see, remember, in Sodom and Gomorrah, morally, morally perverse, turning from what is right, who despise wisdom and instruction. And notice what verse 8 says. My son, listen to the instruction of your father. And do not forsake the Torah, the teaching of the law of your mother. Okay? So, you know, the, the instructions and the teachings of the law of Yahweh is the responsibility of all parents to make their children aware of the curses and the blessings that's found in them. 
And, it, of course, children are an investment, but we have to put it in them. I mean, you know, what you put in them is what you get out of them. But it, it, you have to take the time to teach your children. You can't just put them, put them off on somebody else and expect them to become somebody. Because, you know, it takes effort to raise righteous children. But it's also a command that Yahweh says. In, in Proverbs 22, 6, he says, Train up a child in the way that he would go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, the word train, okay? The word train is number 2596, and it means to narrow. You know, like to straight and narrow. You have to take, you have to narrow things down. You have to take the time to teach your children. You can't let them go the broad way. They're going to die. It also means to initiate or to discipline, to dedicate, to train up. So it takes time. It takes a lot of effort to teach. You can't give up on your children. If you teach them, you know, you notice the directive that's given. It says, if you teach them, okay, train up a child in the way that he should go. If you do it, if the promise is if it's done right, he won't depart from it. Because it will be a guide to him all the days of his life to lead him. Okay, he's not going to forget. They're not going to forget the things that they've been taught. They're going to know and reflect back on what mom and dad taught them. But you can't just teach them to a certain point and just let them go and think, okay, they know enough now. No, they're your responsibility to teach them as long as they're living in your household. You know, uh, you know, really, and we have to follow. We have to follow the example of Father Abraham. Remember in Genesis fourteen fourteen, he says. Now, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed the 318 trained men born in his household, and he went in pursuit to them. Notice, these were the trained men, okay? This is the same one, this is the same word here that means to narrow, to initiate, to discipline, okay? It's the same word that's used there, train up a child, okay? Abraham did this with his whole household, notice. In Genesis 18, 19, for I've chosen him so that he might command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of Yahweh to do what is right and just. And so Yahweh would bring about for Abraham what he has promised to him. Okay, So Abraham did what Yahweh told him to do. And when he did, then of course he was, he was blessed for it because he did what Yahweh told him to do. He was obedient to him. Okay, So that's an example for us that's set in the scriptures to make sure that we follow Okay, the next part here. Um, highlight this, this part here. Entertainment to them, you know, he's talking about the parents. Entertainment to them is putting their children in front of the TV set or with a babysitter and getting out to go to the parties where the excitement is. Okay, that's their entertainment. Put their children in front of a TV set or with a babysitter and then go out. And notice what he says next. He says, no, you can't take your children with you because you wouldn't want them to see the kind of crap. They think that they have to have them in a safe environment where they can't see this kind of crap. Even if your children watch the news, they're going to see this kind of crap today. Okay? And, you know, these are the kind of people who play the hypocrites. You know, oh, they don't want their children to see this kind of stuff. Oh, no, 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 my child couldn't see that, you know. But it's okay for them to do because they're, a, they're an adult, right? They're an adult. And it, it, it's, it's pretty pathetic, but, you know, even people in Hollywood, the so-called movie stars and, and the, rich, the celebrities and stuff like that, they know that their lifestyle and the, the, the work that they do there is not appropriate. And they, some of them have said before, you know, that they don't even allow their children to watch movies or TV or anything like that. Because they know the influence that's going in there. And yet they're living this lifestyle, but yet then they turn around and say they don't want their children to be doing it, though, you know? So it, it shows that they, they really they know what's going on, but they're too ignorant to be able to get out of it, you know? They stay living that lifestyle. And you think about all the stuff that goes on and, and all of this, this stuff, you know, every show and all this kind of stuff is always, remember when we read about romance and stuff, you know? all the kissing and stuff that goes on. <laughs> How many thousands of men's lips have hit that woman's lip already, you know? What is she carrying that you just picked up while you're kissing her, you know? But do they think about this stuff? No, they never think about it at all, you know, of, of the diseases and stuff that's being carried because it doesn't strike them down dead right away, you see? 
so they don't think about it. And this is what, this is what Satan told Eve, you know. You know, don't worry about it. It's not going to bother you. Well, he goes on, he says, I don't know if you've noticed. He says, but right after the news, they catch a huge audience of watchers. And then, uh, he says, that's when, that's when they show what's going, what's, that's when they show what goes on among their stars. Their stars, you know, he says, the ones who shine. Um, the ones who shine. When the scripture speaks of us shining as stars, he says, I will guarantee you it's not like those stars in Hollywood. Remember Daniel 12, verse 3 says that we will be as wise teachers. We will shine as the stars in heaven. Okay? It's not going to be like the stars in Hollywood. He says, I've been to Vegas several times, and I've seen, seen whores who dress better and more modestly than they do in Hollywood at this time. He says that the movie stars who come to you on the television set every evening at 630 you know, right at that time, right after the news is over, these shows come on and so forth. And remember, the Peaceful Solution uh, Character Education Program talks about role models and says how a role model is somebody who will allow you to make right choices, help you make right choices, lead and guide you to make right choices. But this is the kind of role models that they follow in the world. And they wonder why they have all the problems that they do, you know. They wonder why they have so many problems with their children when they just allow their children to do any and everything, you know. They allow their children to go out dating and so forth. Remember what Yahweh says? He says, don't allow your sons and your daughters to commit whoredom, you know. But that's what they do. They allow them to go out and commit sin by, by going out on dates and so forth. You know, and even now there's video games. I don't know, you know, sometimes these, these little advertisements will be on, on a page somewhere and it says, you can do anything in this game. And that's all it says. Just enough to entice someone. You know, well, what, would they, what evil would they want to just do? What lustful evil desire or whatever would they have in their minds that they want to do? Well, that would draw them right into that game. And that's the way that the game is designed. So they could do whatever they wanted. He says, well, work with your children, brethren, and try to get them to listen to these sermons and see the difference in what Yahweh offers... And what is going on in the world? Yahweh's hands are off what is going on in the world. He's letting them bring themselves down. He has to. Remember, as Pastor brought out, you know, he's not going to interfere with Satan's possessions. You know, the world belongs to Satan. And he's not going to step in and bother anybody or try and pull anybody out. He's going to allow them to do what they want to do. He has to. He keeps his own law. Mad cow disease alone, says, notice, mad cow disease alone could destroy the human race. Think about that. Mad cow disease alone could destroy the human race. Now, and it says AIDS alone could destroy the human race. Think about it. When people get sick with these things, mad cow disease takes your mind away, okay, and dementia and so forth. And, of course, AIDS destroys your immune system. And you have caretakers that people have to take care of these people. What if the caretakers get it? Then who's going to take care of that person? And who's going to take care of the caretaker? You know, so it's a source that goes on and on and on, a curse, where you could see that eventually it could destroy the human race completely, these diseases, if everybody starts keeping them. And we're going to see this, you know, with the coronavirus. You're going to see this, these eight billion people affected or six billion because two billion is going to be called out but we're now facing about 70 million cases this is old of course but 70 million cases can you imagine 70 million people having aids and wanting to give it to someone else he says well that's their mindset right now and of course some people who have caught it you know, get up, they're upset and they get angry and they get mad, and so they'll go out and spread it to anybody they possibly can. They're not going to tell them that they have <laughs> AIDS or HIV or anything, but they're going to spread it out as much as they possibly can so that they're not the only ones that has to have it. They have a Christian love that, as Yeshua said, will show its coldness if you just pay attention to what's going on. The world that is out there is temporary, very temporary. You know, it's there's a Christian love, and as Yeshua said, it's going to show us coldness if you just pay attention to what's going on. 
You know, because the Christian love is coldness. It's, it's not real. It's temporary. First John 9, 2, 17, remember it says, The world passes away with the lust in it, but he who does the will of Yahweh abides forever. Okay? First John 9, 2, 17. So if you abide by the word of Yahweh, you're going to live forever. But this world, the lust of this world is going to pass away completely. Okay, on page 126 here, top of the page. He says, we're getting closer to the kingdom of Yahweh. Satan has every one of these people thinking that they're going to enter the kingdom, no matter what kind of lives they're living, filled with what's called sin. Of course, you know, Jesus did it all for, them, for you, right? And that's the way they look upon it. Sin, okay, here's sin, and sin is one of the vocabulary words. Go ahead and underline or highlight this whole paragraph here. Sin, as you know, is going aside. It's called sin, but it's simply going aside from the path that Yahweh says will bring you peace, health, healthy minds, and healthy bodies, joy, love, satisfaction, and above all, peace. Above all is the peace that Yahweh offers you in his way of life. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Read it again. Above all is the peace that Yahweh offers you in his way of life. The way that Yahweh lives is what he wants. He's offering us. That's what he wants us to live. He wants us to live the same lifestyle that he lives. That's just mind-boggling right there. Okay. So he says, this is a secret work as Yahweh calls it. We saw that last week. We're the finishing work. That's what I want you to understand, he says, first as we go into this feast. I want you to understand that this is the finishing touch that Yahweh is going to put on his people. And it's also his last work before his kingdom starts. That's us. That's what he's doing with us now. With the finishing touch that Yahweh is going to put on his people. And it's his last work before his kingdom will start. He says, I'm 100% convinced now that I know when this is going to take place. The plan of Yahweh has never been more clear to his people and hopefully to you because you've been listening to the sermons. And I know that most of you have. But notice what he says. You might have want to underline it. Many people will not come out of this world completely. Many people will not come out of this world completely. He says, I know that. I know the holiest of the holy people are going to. And I know that they will not fall back into the lustful traps that are set for them. But many people will not come out of this world completely. They have a hard time. They'll have a hard time listening to, to the words that, that I oversee is saying and means. The lustful traps. Remember Hebrews 12, 1. He says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entraps us. Okay? And let us run the ways that is set before us with endurance. So notice, sin so easily entraps us. Okay? So easily entraps us. Now, um, highlight this next two sentences, and then we're going to look at something. But lust is so wonderful when it's used correctly between betrothed or married people. But it is so evil when it's used the way that Satan has pushed it. It's so evil the way that Satan has used to push it. Now, here's the note now. Notice it says betrothed, but remember... Once betrothed, they're able to develop a righteous lust or a desire to marry one another. But, of course, physical lust is reserved only for marriage. Okay? So don't think he's talking about having the, that because when somebody's betrothed that they can have a physical lust for one another. They can't. You sin if you do. They're not yours. They're promised to you, but they're not yours. But notice, but it's so evil when it's used the way that Satan has pushed it. You know why? Because evil, because it tears a person down. It tears the self-worth of a person down. This is why when, when women are thought to be easy, as they like to call it, you know, 
they thought about it. They not thought about. They not looked upon as being someone who is a, 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 a worthwhile person. You know, they they just looked upon as being an object, an object of lust, where where a man can use and abuse and push away and go on. You know, but and this is the evil that that is that is presented and what Satan has put into the minds of the people, instead of the righteousness that Yahweh says must exist. So he says, it's not a way of life that will bring joy, peace, or even healthy minds. Because remember, it's going to tear the mind down. Once that enters into your mind, that's it. If you're not on guard and push it out immediately, as hard as you possibly can, and get your mind on righteousness, it's going to take over. And if it takes over, it's going to cause you to sin. It's a temporary life. That Satan, of course, knows and hopes that you'll accept so you won't live very long, okay? It's a temporary life. It's totally temporary. Only Yahweh's way is righteousness, which will last forever. Now, in Revelation 10, verse 7, he says, And in the days of the voice of the seventh Moloch, that is the seventh messenger, he says, if you look at this word angel, okay, angel, that's another vocabulary word. Angel. Highlight, circle that. That you're using, that's using the King James Version, you, he says, you will find it simply means messenger. How you like this? There are two different kinds of messengers. You have people who are messengers, and you have some who Yahweh actually sends from heaven who are messengers. Okay? So you have heavenly messengers, and of course you have the, the earthly messengers, like the seventh messenger. Um, so he says... You have some whom Satan sends. In fact, the third part of the stars, like the movie stars, are leading individuals in heaven. You know, remember, earth only imitates what the gods have taught. And what's going on in the heavens right now is being played out here on earth. Everything that we see. You know, mankind has been, has been taught for 6,000 years and influenced by the gods to live like the gods. And this is why Yahweh says, don't make yourself into a god. Okay? When it says, don't make an image, it's not talking about the little model where you're going to bow down and, and worship, which they did and so forth. But remember that, that idol represented the power of the gods behind it, the demons behind it. But he says, don't make yourselves into gods. And the gods, is, if you lift yourself up above Yahweh, above his laws, then of course you have made yourself into a god. You have taken on the image of God worship. And so earth is only reflecting back what has been taught by the gods. Remember, and it tells you that in Yada, that in the same manner like Sodom and Gomorrah, in the same manner as what the gods had committed in the heavens of all the abominations, the same thing was done in Sodom and Gomorrah, carried on. So the scriptures show you that. A third part of the leaders are ones who she knows that she can trust and work with. These are the ones who will help her in her cause. A third part of the ones who were actually used in heaven to bring about her teachings to begin with were sent to earth to assist her in any way she wants. While Yahweh says, hands off, just don't kill them. Okay, and he's talking about us. He's talking about the house of Yahweh. The gates of hell cannot prevail against the house of Yahweh. We have to live. We have to experience and see all the hellacious things that's going to take place with mankind so that we can, be, we can have our minds open and blessed and realize that we went through. Remember, they're going to say, when they look upon us and think that we have been in the last days, we lived in the last days in this nuclear age, we went through more than any of the other generations previously before us. And they're going to be astounded, and they're going to ask us about these things. And, of course, we're going to have a thousand years teaching them bringing them up to the point where we are now. Well, the same example took place with Eob or Yeshub. He says, if you heard that message, it's not finished yet. He says, I made about three or four tapes on it, but I have that many to go. Yahweh willing, I will get back to it and finish it, hopefully, after the feast sometime. But in the days of this angel, the days of this messenger, or the Moloch, if you look it up, he says it means messenger. And there were seven messengers or seven time periods that took place here where Yahweh has seven different works, and he brought this forth as a kind of secret works. And he brought this forth as a kind of secret works to the world. You remember, even Yahshua said, 
He told his disciples, he said, man, he said, the prophets would have longed to have understand and seen the things that you see and you hear. You know, but they didn't understand it either. If Satan could, notice he says, she would have destroyed Moshe, the one who fished out of this, who was fished out of the water. But Yahweh saved him, brought him forth, and then later used him after he finally got the evil and the self righteousness out of him. Okay, you know, and she tried to get rid of. Remember, it talks about that she disputed over the, the the body of Moshe. You know, well, that could be taken as the dead body, of course, or the body of people, the congregation that Moshe had. Uh, she was trying to get them. Because, you know, you get rid of the leader, of course, you can scatter the people after that. And that's what she was hoping to do. But he says, this is another problem, notice. Self-righteousness. Highlight that. Self-righteousness. This is another vocabulary word. And notice he says, you can't be more righteous than Yahweh. If you keep his law strictly, that is righteousness. If you think you can top that, then that is called self-righteousness. And it doesn't work. Now, I like the rest of this paragraph. In fact, you're going against his law and taking something away from yourself or from others. If you try to enforce something that you think is more righteous than what is written in the laws of Yahweh. Okay? Self-righteousness. You remember, this was a problem that they had in... Romans 10, 1 through 3, it says, Brothers, my heart's longing and prayer for Yahweh, for Israel is that they might be saved. For I can testify to them that they're zealous for Yahweh, but their zeal is not according to knowledge, notice, since they being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from Yahweh and seeking to establish their own righteousness. They have not submitted to Yahweh's righteousness. So Yahweh's righteousness is submitting to keeping his law. And that's what's called the faith of the saints, right? keeping the laws of Yahweh. But instead, they went to establish their own righteousness, okay? And this is why they fell into the Talmud and got into all this crazy idiot stuff that they, that they teach, you know, instead of the laws of Yahweh. Okay, now Romans 1.17 says, For this is the message of the righteousness of Yahweh revealed. For in this is the righteousness, the message of Yahweh revealed. Originating from the faith and leading to the faith, it is written, The just will live by the faith. What faith? Remember, Yada 1.3 says, Beloved, I gave you all diligence to write to you about the common salvation. I found it necessary to write to you and exhort that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which was noticed once and for all delivered to the saints. It's only one faith. Remember, and that's what Ephesians 4.5 says. There's one Father, there's one faith. It was delivered to the saints, and the just will live by the faith. And you remember Yahshua said, well, when he comes, will he find the faith on this earth, you know? Um, so he goes on here, and uh, verse 1, we'll highlight this too. It says, another, I saw another mighty Malik come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and a rainbow under his feet, and his face were as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire, Okay. Um, another Moloch. In the twelfth book, in the twelfth book of Israel, part two, chapter seven, verses 12, 11 to twelve, he says, "And after these things, I saw another Moloch come down from heaven. That is, he says, it's the orders came down from heaven. It wasn't like a being coming down from heaven and start bringing this message. They were orders. Inspiration came from heaven, as it is prophesied to be done." And as the prophet spoke on the inspiration, so in these last days the work would be brought forward again. And then when you see the word another Moloch, okay, it means another message that's being brought forth by the house of Yahweh, okay? Uh, another message. So when it says another Moloch, it simply means another message being brought forth. So let's get back to the book here. He says, Now I saw another Moloch come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and with a rainbow under his feet, and his face, as it were, the sun, and his feet as the pillars of fire. He says, This was a strange looking being, I'm sure, if you just think about the way it's describing him. The way we see it in the English and the way it's actually written in the Hebrew are very different things. Highlight this next sentence. It was just showing the positions here that the man held or the being held who was actually set or sent from Yahshua to talk with Yachanan. 
So that's what this cloud and rainbow and so forth and his feet as pillars of fire, it represented the positions that the seventh Moloch has. And of course, this was Yeshua's messenger. He has messengers the same as Satan. This is the one who had great authority as those who work with Satan had great authority in heaven. And they're the ones she chose to go with her. You know, you can always use your, pull your strongest ones, the ones who will support you when you go out to, to, to do any kind of thing. And this is what Satan has done. She had to remember the two thirds over here as we read. She had the two thirds of these these individuals, these leading individuals, the third part of the leaders in heaven there. She pulled them forth and she used them to be able to accomplish her job of deceiving the whole world, as it says in Revelation 12, 9. Okay? So this is the one who had great authority as those who work with Satan had great authority in heaven, and they're the ones she chose to go with her. And in continuing Revelations, it says, And he had a little book open in his hand. He set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. And he cried with a loud voice as a lion roars. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. He says, All of this is meanings, has meanings, but he says, I don't have time to go into it at this time. So he says, When the seven thunders, uh, underline this, or highlight it, uttered their voices, he says, You know, this is the different position or a different authority, a different rank that was held here, and when they had certain jobs to do, in other words. Okay, so when they're uttering their voices, this is the different positions, the different ranks of authority, this is the different jobs that they have to do, okay? And this is what he used to bring forth the house in these last days. So this is nothing, it's, it's nothing, you know, like it says, there's nothing new under the sun, this is something that, is, that, that Yahweh has always used. Continue on, he says, and when they heard, and when they had done it, uh, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up these things. Now notice, this is when Pastor tells him, Yachanan, seal up the books. You, you're not allowed, you're not going to be able to bring this, forth, this information forth. You're not going to be able to understand it. Seal up these things. And remember, as Daniel said, you know, this is why Daniel and Revelation is so t closely tied together, because Dan in Daniel it says, Daniel sealed this up, it's till the time of the end. Well, with the Akanon, he says, this is the time of end, but you still have to seal these things. Well, you remember, it says that the one who opened the seals was Yeshua. Yeshua opened the seals and he revealed these things to the one he works with, in Zechariah 6, the one who he works with closely, the man who's known as the branch, and revealed these things. He says, now if you remember, we will see this in Daniel later. He was showing this at the end of the things that I want to show you at this time period. If you remember, there's a verse in Revelations that we will read that says, I'm going to show you the things that have been, things that will be, and then things that will take place in the end. So things that have been, that's the past. Things that will be, okay, or is, okay, that's the, the, the present. And then the things which will take place in the end, the future. So you have it all covered here in this time period. And that's the way that Yahweh is, because Yahweh is the only being who can tell or foretell the future, right? He tells you like it is. And so this is the last work that he's going to show you here as he showed Yachanai. This is the voice of the seventh messenger, okay? Seventh messenger. Now we have to stop here. We'll take off from that point next week. Uh, but keep those things in mind. You know, this, the, all these things were revealed only to you. Okay? Only to you as the house of Yahweh. We're the only ones on the face of this earth out of the billions and billions of people. Only the house of Yahweh knows this stuff. So remember this and always give thanks to Yahweh for it.